Right, and I think we chose we chose to begin with this book as we I think we spoke about in our in our first podcast episode. We chose this book because ostensibly it's his it's the beginning. Uh, it's how any English reader would have encountered him uh, in a kind of chronological sense. But I think that we realized in reading it that um, it's not it's an excellent book as a beginning point to Zizek because a I think it's one of his better books. It's really it's really quite a good read. Um, it's both theoretically important and I think it it, it exemplifies what becomes his strategy, at least for the English reader, as you encounter more of his works. I think it really lays out a good framework for, for what, you, what you can begin to expect from his work. But also, I think what we, we discovered in talking together and in talking with, with Zizek himself and Todd McGowan is that there's something exemplary in this book for um, the rest of his project that I think is even uh, almost more relevant now. Uh, and I think that begins with a synthesis in that book of of some important thinkers that he uh, actualizes in the, in his present work. Yeah. So in it, we find the the core of his trajectory in terms of combining Hegel, Lacan, and Marx, and um, in an almost Hegelian sort of way, and expanding on his work in the present moment, especially where Zizek has kind of explored his ontological position more. It's very interesting to go back to this book. And kind of see where the the core of his synthesis of these thinkers lies, and it's actually still extremely relevant today. Right. Well, it, the 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 important bridge between I think um, ideology and the tr- understood in the traditional Marxist sense, which we we encounter at the beginning of this book, um, towards a ontological position, which we I, um, we meet we meet uh, an ontological position, I think, with Zizek in his more recent works, is that we see in this book uh, the historic um, assumption of the end of ideology as such, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, uh, the concept of the end of history, in which a grand narrative of antagonism is ending. I think it seems like at, at that point in time, on, on uh, the level of ideological analysis, as like, if you're coming at it from a point of view of as two opposing ideologies, and it's a matter of like which side you're on, and it's a, an ideology is just basically sort of what you what you think about a given political topic. Um, Zizek interjects here in a in a very distinct and and very kind of unprecedented way in terms of the way that he sets up ideology and the 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 analysis of ideology, especially given the context of. You know the end of really existing socialism, at least in the European world, with not a kind of refutation of that ideology, but more kind of going more in depth um, as a critique of ideology. Well, well, Zizek's point, I think, the the ontolo- where where we we go from an, an analysis of, an, of ideology into an ontological stance is that we uh, the assumption in 1989 was one of harmony, one of post antagonism, and Zizek's ideological stance influenced by his Lacanian and Hegelian reading of Marx's notion of ideology is one that, that we, we cannot be post-ideological. We cannot be in a, in a time post the, uh, sort of an original antagonism, which is, uh, I think, drawn out in the Marxist understanding of ideology, the Kantian understanding of the sublime, and then the Lacanian and Hegelian notions of object and 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 uh, right. ontolo- an ontology in the subject and i and that's peter was that that was the sort of last time we spoke this was a new division that you'd seen quite literally in the title of the book right yeah so it's interesting because um the sublime object of ideology as a title is in a way quite confounding and impressive and you um it kind of and in some way obscures the simplicity of its of itself because what we get in in the title sublime object ideology is a reference to the kind of tripartite of the approach that Zizek is going to take in the sublime we see Kant and Hegel in the object we see Lacan and in ideology we see Marx and then 
Zizek is going to kind of trace that line and then um, kind of synthesize it in a very unique way. And I think we'll get into that through his use of specific examples and um, get into more of the kind of finer moments that he takes us through in the book. But maybe we want to set up a few things that he initially kind of orients around as his starting point in the book. And I think there's three things that he mentions in terms of um, what his intent is in the in the book itself. Does anyone want to maybe reference that for us? Sure. Yeah. This is right. This is right in the in the introduction, right, and uh, um, right towards the end of it, he he, I ba- he basically outlines what he's going to do, which I which I love as as an explicit introduction. Uh, he he sets up what he's going to do, and I think it's important that during the reading, especially because Zizek could be quite discursive, to keep these three points in in mind. We have a kind of the, the first point is um, Zizek aims to basically explain fundamental concepts of Lacanian psychoanalysis. Uh, and I think uh, this is an important first point because he's going to use uh, Lacan as a tie between, or sort of a more extreme version of Enlightenment thinking. So he uses Lacan to branch Kant to Hegel, uh, which is his second point, which is a return to Hegel, a kind of mutual resuscitation by way of Lacan. And, and Hegel, of understanding the sublime in terms of a more contemporary understanding of ideology, and which is his the third point, which is a new theory or perhaps a more exact analysis of ideology and how it pertains to today. Um, I think those are the three points, unless, unless there's something you guys wanted to add to those. Yeah, well, um, obviously it's a, it's, it's a big... It's a big project to try to talk about this book in a period of an hour, um, and we clearly won't be able to um, uh, outline sufficiently, you know, every every um, fundamental concept of Lacanian psychoanalysis that Zizek uses, or or thoroughly describe the um, passage from Kant to Hegel. But I think what we can do is uh, find a certain inroad into the book by talking about. I think maybe first. Um, Perhaps Kant's concept of the sublime, which might give us an inroad into thinking of what a sublime object is, and then to kind of tie that through a discussion of ideology. Does that sound good? Sounds like a good trajectory. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so um, so taking the title and that position as a starting point, does anyone want to hazard a explanation of Kant's notion of the sublime? Well, I think I think just just as a to keep it brief. In uh, I believe it's in the critique of judgment that Kant uh, really approaches the concept of the sublime, and to to distill it, it's this the subject's encounter with the sublime is part of a double movement in which the subject comes to know the limits of his reason. That the sublime is an experience that uh, delimits what can be reasoned, and I think for the importance of our discussion. Uh, for Zizek, what happens in this double movement is that we understand in the experience or encounter of the sublime our limits of reason, but also that uh, through through Hegel we understand that it's not just a delimiting of reason, but it's that the limitation is part of reasoning. That there is not something yeah, structural. Yeah, yeah, that the sublime doesn't gesture towards a beyond reason, but that there's a structural uh, and fundamental. Uh, lack in reasoning itself that the sublime underlines. Right. So what we what we maybe get here is like uh, in a straightforward way is that Kant sets up a notion of the sublime that he he describes according to his philosophy as an encounter of of the limits of rationality where um, we're at once made aware as to those limits, but also of the complete kind of radical separation um, of the absolute and the subject. Considered from a Kantian position, the sublime uh, as an object, um, Zizek will say in, in, in the book, um, is therefore a, a paradox of an object which, in the very field of representation, provides a view in a negative way of the dimension of what is unrepresentable. Um, which, yes. Seems, yeah. which seems, I think, at first blush, possibly Hegelian, um, but I think that it's missing a dimension that's, that's crucial for Hegel and, and 
in his own way, Lacan, but he doesn't quite call it this. Um, Jake, you mentioned it before, his lack for Lacan, but I think with Hegel, it's nothingness. So this this sounds very complicated, and 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 of course it is. But I think that like what's crucial there is um, what Kant is sorry, what Hegel is is developing out of that notion, uh, or what's possible to develop um, as a Hegelian twist on that notion is there's nothing beyond the representation or even the failure to represent, it's the the appearance of the representation or the appearance or the appearance is itself um the failure to to fully represent. That that's it, yeah. Will that did I get it there? Yeah. I, like, I, I, yeah. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is like appearance as appearance in the Hegelian sense is not something that's like overlaying or obfuscating um some something that's that's behind it or inaccessible um beyond it but rather the there's a like in that motion of appearance um there isn't anything beyond it the appearance obscures the fact that there's nothing beyond it to begin with so when we interact with this with the sublime object it's this kind of intermingling of a feeling of like be, of like beyond or even terror or incapacity to understand but as a sublime object it um, it disturbs that that layer of, of representation or of meaning, which which is never which is fundamentally never complete. And I think in the Kantian divide, you have this notion of a beyond and a completeness of representation. But with the sublime object is a, is this fracturing that I think Zizek is is going to is is going to emphasize that in uh, in the the realm of appearance itself, we don't have a totality. It is not ever complete. And so it's not necessarily a problem of representation or that there is a realm of the supersensible. It's that in the, the tension between the concept or the universal and the subject is this impossibility that is inherent. And it's not a deficiency on either side. So we got a kind of passage here where um, from Kant to Hegel, as Zizek describes in The Sublime Object, we get um, a movement from there being a kind of... Uh, um, otherness between the two dimensions to that appearance of otherness being inscribed into the ontological position itself. And then, That's it exactly. Yeah. And then maybe we want to go, we want to take up the object side of this because we're, at this point we want, we're talking about the notion of the sublime. We don't, we, don't, we don't want to get too far into the notion of sublime object before we bring in Lacan. Um, so I think we want to maybe trace where Zizek takes us from Hegel to Lacan uh, at this point, does anyone want to describe maybe how that notion of the kind of absence in the ontological position uh, can be for Lacan the absence that's embedded in the symbolic order itself? Right, and and the, and and the symbolic order is the term that I think we want to lean on here. Um, is that the symbolic order arises around its own failure? Is that the symbolic order is uh, constitutively incomplete for Lacan, and that something like the sublime functions as what Zizek calls the pure signifier, which is something that masks this incompleteness and around its, uh, itself, so it gathers all that can mean and all that can be articulated. But what it is masking is the impossibility to articulate a total or complete frame. And, and I think the, sim the symbolic realm, as a Lacanian term, really helps us understand uh, this, this sort of this Hegelian ontological extension of Kant's understanding of the sublime, which is that we have a, uh, in experience itself, a fundamental impossibility uh, in which the universal and the subject are brought into a new kind of tension that Lacan clarifies in the subject's relation to the symbolic order. Right, and the subject kind of embedded in the symbolic order because there's fundamentally what Zizek calls a kind of impossibility about the symbolic order in that the signifier can never fully um, encapsulate or explain what it is that it is signifying. There's always a kind of separation there. Yes. And that separation is that very impossibility, right? And, and onwards with Lacan, that signifier becomes a part of the signifying order, right? The chains of signification, of meaning, of the description of reality, what we're in, in the next step going to call ideology. But 
um, for Lacan, there's nothing, there's no subject and no meaning that is not embedded in the symbolic order. Right, and and he'll he'll go so so far as to say there is no, you know, there is no big other, there is no symbolic order, mm-hmm. and and thus there is no subject, but. But there, but there is, right? Is that? But is that... There, there is, in as much as uh, the way that the signifying process works is, it doesn't matter if there's anything at the root there because it still it still functions as if there is. So exactly, I think money is also a really good representation of this. In that, you know, when we get you get to a certain point when you're a teenager where you where you claim, man, like money does not exist. Yeah, and in a, in a certain kind of factual way that's that's true right like they kind of invent money on a screen somewhere but money functionally absolutely does exist it has it has a kind of exchange value it um, has an impact on the way people live their lives and symbolically it means something and that kind of symbolic element is where we're going to go in terms of what we mean by objects right like objects are places of signifiers they're at once a kind of material element but um just as we're saying there's a kind of impossibility of signification there's there's a there there's a meaning oriented around objects that is kind of um around it but impossibly connected to it yeah yeah uh, i th- yeah so it seems it seems that that psychoanalysis and lacan helps us better understand um, I think the problem of, I, I think what it does is it, it just sort of more aggressively defines the problem that Hegel um, extrapolates from Kant in, into a more ontological framework, where we have a kind of a sense of reality is simply not there, but in the ways in which it is there, it's covering over this not being, this nothingness, right? It's like um, that there's this constitutive sort of fantasy or symbolic order, which um, is constitutively uh, illusory, and yet it works on us in real ways, right? And that we are, we are, not, we are, we articulate it. Um, and um, and I think so. So, Pete, I, this definition of of object does it does it help us? The, uh, you know, uh, as a as a signifier within a certain chain of signifiers, does it help us understand what we might mean by sublime object? How can we how can we um, extend this notion of object to sublime object? Right. Um, before getting there, I, maybe I just want to reference um, one Lacanian concept, um, the quilting point, which is if we think about a button on a mattress, it's that kind of through line that that brings the whole mattress together. And what Lacan describes um, is how a, a chain of signification is brought together by a specific quilting point, that which gives that chain of, of signifiers a cohesive meaning. Um, and then what the sublime object does for Zizek is it is a place of that meaning. So um, perhaps we want to go towards a description of sublime object by talking about um, the Titanic, which Zizek actually explains in a very interesting way. Yeah, but, but and it would be important to remember this point of the, of the quilting point um, as a kind of an element that, as Zizek will say, an element that holds the place of a certain lack and around it sort of organizes all that can be articulated. Uh, the Titanic is, for me, a, co- a bit of a difficult example, even though it, it animates um, the part of the text that he's really getting the concept of the sublime object going. Um, but I think his basic basic point about the Titanic is that it's at once this uh, full brimming representation of something. So the Titanic at the beginning is, you know, the unsinkable ship. It represents the, the triumph of uh, technology, the triumph of the capacities, the exploratory capacities of man. And it's a microcosm of Europe, you know, with its yeah. class divides and and it, exactly um, it's all there. Was, there. There was hundreds of billions of dollars on that ship, mm-hmm. and yeah, Leonardo and gold, DiCaprio, right? and Le- and Leo Dio. <laughs> um, so it's it's that, and then it's also the symbol of of complete disaster and of um, kind of a kind of like almost catastrophic um, over. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A kind of like 
hubris hubris that's a, that's it yeah um but but of course we can only see that after the fact so like it, it the titanic is the first thing but also it's at once this disaster and it's hubris and it's and it's also the wreck you know we have the material of the titanic so it's all these things wrapped together at once yeah and i think i think that that's the that's what makes it different than a normal object um but uh jake i, th I feel like you would do a good job here of describing how the supply the titanic might be a sublime object zizek's analysis of ideology really really plays a part here in understanding how the titan how the titanic is a sublime object because we have what you said a symbol a symbolic over determination in which we have all of this meaning both of uh, prior to the titanic's wreck and then what it represents after its wreck but he why he chooses the titanic is because one can still dive down and see the skeleton of this of this object and it's sort of what he would call it sort of terrifying real presence and how it functions as a sublime object is that any attempt to symbolize it either uh, prior to its wreck or after its wreck is what Zizek would say is is merely an attempt to escape its terrifying impact how it exceeds any symbolization and I think why this is a, a why as a sublime object it opens up a conversation of ideology is because any sublime object and going back to Peter what you said about quilting points will function in a way that outlines all that can be symbolized but also represents a kind of a marker or a stand-in of an element that cannot be represented that still is there and present but what it in its presencing suggests an impossibility of representation or symbolization. It's almost like it's like the Titanic is such a good representation. And this is what, what we were trying to say before, I think, is that the sub sublime object at the same time works too well and also doesn't work well enough. So like the Titanic yes, yeah, works so yeah. well as a sim as a symbol, but when we when we look for the Titanic and we try to identify it in the way that we might do any other object, it's it's harder to find. You know, it, we we get caught up in the inconsistencies of the object itself. You know, and is it is it the wreck? Is it is it the films? Is it you know is it any of these things? Right, but the crucial is that it's it's still a matter of symbolization because um, while the the kind of horrifying real object is down there at the bottom of the ocean. That is kind of, in a sense, not at all what the Titanic is. Yes, and mm -hmm. it's and any single representation is also not at all what the Titanic is. So there's this, this dynamic between the object, its signification, and that that um, impossible space between them, which is reminiscent of the impossible space between the subject and the kind of um, sub sublime notion of that Kant or Hegel gives us, right? Like that 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 radical separation between what is signified and what is the object um, is embedded in both of those things in, a, in, a, in an impossibility in an absence in a fundamental negativity yes that is crucial to the way the subject intervenes in that in that chain of signification that's a good point the the, the negativity that you say that that is repressed or um, uh, masked by the object itself and its terrifying presence or by extension the the nothingness or the impossibility that is um, masked by a quilting point or a sublime object uh, is repressed, but will be articulated in coded and what Zizek will say coded and ideological forms. Is that so? The subject is inherently or or has to identify and is made subject uh, by whatever is proposed by this quilting point as ontologically consistent. Right? Is that we have. In the state, in this, in this, uh, in the place of this nothingness, a quilting point that, despite the nothingness that it masks, will project a kind of consistency, uh, um, uh, exactly of of, yeah. of experience. So, right? this is this is um, perhaps what we can say. Lacan is referencing by the notion of there is no big other, right? Like, ultimately, the big other functions as a placeholder of a void, and that this linchpin this quilting point is the um, kind of site of signification and um, of ideology, but is fundamentally um, sourced on nothingness. However, it works functionally, just as we were discussing with money or with God. I would say it's like, like Jake was just saying, like it's a kind of meeting point between 
consistency and inconsistency. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where I think we would find the Lacanian subject, but, but, but I think this, this is where Zizek is, is, is careful to say that the Lacanian subject is not simply just an illusion or alienated in the symbolic realm that doesn't exist and the big other doesn't exist. And so the subject doesn't exist. Zizek's willing to take this like one step further. Uh, and I think by advancing uh, the Lacanian notion of fantasy is that once we establish yeah. that the symbolic realm is merely the product of a fundamental lack or nothingness, once we establish that, that's only the first step of, of an ideological analysis. The second step is to identify with the fantasy, is to see in the fact that we occupy an inconsistent realm. Um, it, 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 that's that's the second procedure is what to do once right. we understand because this. because if you if you simply stopped at that first dimension um you would be left in a in a kind of postmodern um infinite critique right where you once you make the claim that you know the text uh doesn't really exist or the there's no fundamental meaning to the text there's only the reading of the text you you kind of lose yourself in infinite readings, but but Zizek and Lacan are saying that that's the starting point. And then once you once you grant that there's a kind of impossibility there, you then see it as this kind of positive site of signification or a positive site of ideology. If if I can quote Zizek here um, in the Sublime Object of Ideology, this is where we I think this is where we get the the branch between Hegel and Lacan. And then, and then I think a new form of analysis for, of ideology is that he says uh, on page 30, it is uh, uh, ideology, the fundamental level of ideology is not that of an illusion masking the real state of things, but that of an unconscious fantasy structuring our social reality itself. So we have the, the new problem, which is that to confront uh, ideology is to confront how it actually is the only framework in which we can confront the real of, of, of our desire, or what is announced in the nothingness uh, suggested by any quilting point or any ideological framework. It's that the framework itself, despite being illusory and fantastical, is our only access to it, the eruption of the real, where it is inconsistent. Um, exactly, yeah. There's no outside, there's no outside of, this, of this framework. Which is a, yeah, which is a deeply Hegelian... That's a, that's a deeply Hegelian point, right, is that we, we started with at the beginning, is that Hegel picks up the Kantian notion of sublime and says that there, the outside is always already within, that the substance is yeah. always subject, that we have no concept of the universal except in its particularity. And, and I think that this is, you'll have to uh, allow, afford me this, this uh, tangent, but this is also from the sublime object of, of ideology, where Zizek is talking about the Freudian understanding of dreams. And this, this is in part... Uh, uh, analogous to his understanding of, of an analysis of ideology is it's not simply about the dream's latent content, what certain things mean in the dream, but about why it takes the form of a dream in the first place. And this is, if we can, if we can start talking about ideology, this is why I think, look, uh, Zizek takes up Marx, but takes Marx to a place that he could not, is that um, it's not about understanding capital, for example, and the way that it works, but why capital in the first place is that it's no longer a problem of thinking or, or rather of, of, of thinking or of systems or of, a, of an antagonism between two ideologies, but it's about understanding why it takes that ideological framework in the first place is that there's a more original antagonism suggested by the sublime object. Um, if, you, if, you, if you roll with me on that, I, 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 it's that it's not simply about how ideology works. So we can take up the sort of cynical position. Well, it's not maybe in a, in a different way. It's not simply about the material conditions of ideology, which is also something that Marx focuses exactly. on. Exactly. But the um, there is a there is a material element here as a, a sublime object. But Zizek is saying that there is no like in order for there to be ideology as such, there has to be signification, and there's there's nothing that is not signification. Yes, I think that the sublime object is is that instance in which we get a like piercing through um as a kind of on the one hand full representation of the ideological reality but also the kind of moment at which it elapses or fails 
Exactly. It's 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 positive representation and it's dissolution. Is that the 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 framework or around a quilting point around a uh, around a, uh, a sublime object shows us the points of rupture, right? Shows us where the traumatic kernel of the real has its positive embodiment in in its very masking of this sort of of the real, right? So the real uh, that's uh, that is hidden by a quilting point shows us how reality is such and the symbolic order is such and ideology is such is never coherent is never consistent and will always be born out of a fundamental uh, co- contradiction or inconsistency and and it's only through that within the ideology within the ideology itself it it seeks to be and and feels like it's a full complete total representation of you know capital R reality but um T- uh, Todd in a, in a great video on ideology um, said that ideology is structuring um, our entire social reality and it's doing so allows us to escape from some traumatic kernel and he goes on to say that ideology obscures the real with reality which I think is a really good way of putting it yes that, yes that like the you know and actually where we started the conversation I think can, we can we can bring to this moment in that like at the uh, in 1989 you know in the the triumph of western liberal capitalism or democracy or however you want to phrase it like in that you know and in in the context in which we grew up like you get a feeling of a post ideological world but Zizek says that this is this is the purest this is ideology at its purest you know except yeah except that there is no alternative and and the way that that we live ideologically currently and this is something that Zizek talks about a lot is that um, it, we move from the Marxian notion of, of we don't know what we're doing and we're doing it anyway to a notion of we do know what we're doing and we're doing it anyway. Because an ideological position these days, politically speaking perhaps, is where you know you take given issues, you know that, that you kind of stand outside of, of prevailing um, ideological framework, free to choose what you want. Um, and that's a, that's a very clear... Um, description of we know what we're doing like we know we're choosing our ideology but we're still ideological we're still beholden to those ideologies that we nonetheless believe that we're choosing exactly yeah, like- that i think a, a subject tries to at least at least uh a kind of postmodern pr- potentially um uh liberal subject tries to escape the 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 fundamental problem of ideology by saying listen i i know how I act ideolo- ideologically. I know how I participate in this false coherence of an ideological framework, and yet I act despite. And I think what happens with Peter, your you, your nod to maybe what what a current uh, uh, left subject sort of looks like or believes is that I can have sort of uh, my cake and eat it too. Is that I can understand how I am subjected by a, a particular ideological framework and and participate in its false coherence and yet there is no other alternative i'm sort of subjected to it in a way of resign of, of, of resignation and i and this yeah. and zizek says this perfectly at the beginning of the book uh, if i if you allow me to quote him uh he says the pro- this is the problem the fundamental dimension of ideology ideology is not simply a false consciousness an illusory representation of reality it is rather this reality itself which is already to be conceived as ideological and he goes on to say Ideological is a social reality whose very existence implies the non-knowledge its participants as to its essence. So the non-knowledge of how an ideological framework works is actually uh, its essence, right? Which which, right, which, right. Fuel, which fuels this cynical approach to ideology. And um, I think that the purpose of this book is to see what the next step is. To not be this sort of disavowed, cynical, uh, I participate in a coherence despite its being false, is to see that any ideological notion of coherence is, is gathered around or originates out of a more fundamental contradiction. It's also a nod to the psychoanalytical approach in general, right? Like becoming aware of these structures, right? These, the way in which we as subjects um, kind of enact or participate in the functioning of ideology it's not to say that we should somehow step outside of that because ultimately we can't but 
what Lacan and what Zizek is describing is the the function of uh, psychoanalytical um, the project is to reorient ourselves, um, perhaps uh, in an ideal way, uh, around new signifiers and and create new chains of signification. Right. Yes. And but before we get to that to that kind of maybe maybe moment of winding down, I wonder if I could a ask you guys a question that I think or a response that a lot of people have to this book that I think is worth kind of working through. Um, it's that it's that, you know, basically like, OK, why is Zizek so smart? Why does he think his, he's beyond ideology if ideology is everything? You know, what what gives him the right? How would you, how would you yeah. respond to that getting? Because I think like, you know, it, it does kind of bring up a certain you know, maybe valid post-structuralist rejoinder to the question of ideology, namely that, like, how can you assert one narrative over another? Or in, in more specific terms, is this not just a matter of discourse or discursive relations? And is there not always a basic kind of relativism to be accounted for? But I think that the way that Zizek is dealing with ideology in this book is, is certainly not that. Um, it's not... It's not just gesturing just to the plurality of possible interpretations, but like that there is possible a, a more penetrating interpretation, a more effective analysis or symptomal reading. And I think I think that's kind of it. Like the like the yeah, it's it's it's, it's a more kind of interpretive process. I, I think the book as a whole would be would actually you could def, you could define it as a, as a response to relativism or to the sort of nihilistic avowal of of ideology as as complete as coherent is that i think nihilism or or um a situation in which we would criticize zizek for being po you know for for claiming that you know fine everything is ideological i think what he's saying is that y yes true it is ideological and because it is ideological can we navigate how things can be uh different otherwise otherwise yeah. but but this isn't simply i mean i think will like you said this is a this is a i think a thoroughly deconstructive notion is that things are not as they are given it, it's in fact i think zizek is saying things are given things are given i think things are like the multiplicity of responses um aren't multiple ideological realities but in zizek's terms are are a multitude of responses to the same as he puts it impossible real kernel if I were to make a final point about this book, um, uh, from my opinion, it seems that what Zizek is saying is that ideology is necessary only to escape the truth of ideology, is that a, a kind of multiplicity of, of ideological stances are always at play to obscure from the, from the actor, from the, from the subject, that uh, that. The, the the true the true origin of ideology is that any ideology is an attempt to escape what is masked by an ideological framework, um, and that and that's and I, that's where I think will this book is a response to essentially reductive relativism. Uh, it's because Zizek is saying that in any ideological framework, what we're doing is escaping the truth of ideology. Is that ideology proposes a coherence where there where there is not a coherence, and that mm -hmm. from Peter to return to Hegel. If you'd like to do do that, is that is that Hegel allows us to see that what is being escaped in any ideology is its origin as inherently contradictory. But yeah, I don't know. I think that's a I think that's a great point, and I think that like going in in the way that G, that Zizek announces that kind of return to Hegel, I think that's exactly what he's trying to do is to follow you know follow these moments, these points of contradiction, and I think. I think that's what the sublime object is, you know, it's something that that is and is not that that is complete that is complete and and completely not. Well, yeah. the fact that the fact that um a given ideological structure, let's say neoliberalism or um Stalinism, et cetera, the fact that they change and at the end alludes to the inconsistency of ideology, right? Like um it doesn't say that we can somehow step outside of it, but that there are different frameworks with which um, substance, the world is, can be understood. Right. And that's not a, an infinite regress of postmodernism because the, it, it does exceed the subjective position, right? Like um, capital or money or God exists in the symbolic order 
uh, to be perceived and understood by different subjects mm -hmm. in different times. But that inconsistency also alludes to the fact that the ideological structure can change. And that, that possibility is, I think, where Zizek leaves us. And it's not to say that he's ends on this, this sort of super high note of like, oh, let's all come together and decide on a new ideology. But just that, that, that possibility is the kind of crucial moment of the critique of ideology. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But that uh, what is impossible in every ideology means that uh, the impossible is always possible, right? An ideological framework only ever attests to the fact that its contradiction, uh, what is its origin, at, like, 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 you, like you said about the sublime object, Will, like what makes it positive but also its disillusion is always possible, is that the impossibility of the sublime object suggests that any ideological framework has at its origin the, the eruption of the impossible, the eruption of its contradiction. And, and that's, like, that's, I think, what Zizek is, is gesturing with the sublime object is, is, like you said, it's not about picking a new ideology. It's about understanding that in the framework of ideology itself is uh, always imminent its, its contradiction, the impossible. Right. Well, I think, that's a, I think that's as good a place to leave it as any. So, Yeah, we have some great interviews lined up. I think next we're talking to Matt McManus. And um, he's going to tell us about postmodern conservatism and Zizek and Jordan Peterson. And it will be very interesting to see that where that conversation goes. Yeah. Thanks, guys. L looking, looking forward to that one a lot. And uh, yeah, nice talking to you guys. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. And show up it. And show on and show on. And so on and so on. And so on and so on. And so on and so on.